I had a discussion, I actually still have a video clip at home. Hugo Herr Kies and I talked, uh, it was probably 2004 at the IC in Reading. Yes, 2004, 2003, yeah. I can't remember what it was. Uh, we discussed Beethoven. <laughs> um, so, so I think we can have a similar discussion today, Beethoven and so on. So, um, but before that, I think most people know who, who Kies is. But nonetheless, I'll sort of, you know, academics here, academics have sort of certain things to look for. So, Keith, do you mind if I ask you where you graduated from? I graduated at Eindhoven University. I was at that time working for Philips, and uh, I graduated at Eindhoven University, and then later also did my PhD at uh, Eindhoven University with work I did at Philips Research. Okay, and I believe you, you graduated directly from wrong in mathematics? I graduated in. Uh, Electrical engineering. Okay, see, I was wrong. Yes, see, you also graduated in mathematics. <laughs> but to make more, uh, to make the things more complicated, I am a, a professor in Germany at the Institute of Experimental Mathematics because my mathematics has always been very um, experimental. I said so. Uh, that's why. <laughs> because you never know if the plus or minus is correct. So that's probably the experimental in the mathematics. My mathematics. <laughs> the plus or minus only counts if you talk about the issue. <laughs> that's fine, that's fine. And two zeros and ones, yes, that's fine. Yes, that's right. Okay. So, we see you've got an interesting background to start off with. Now, you mentioned uh, Philips. Um, would you like to just give us a brief summary of what you did apart from the compact stuff? I, um, I started at Philips as a young engineer so, uh, in a time when Philips research was um, inventing the uh, optical technology and they well, there was a small group in the, in the physics department working on optical recording, and they called it the video long play record, okay? That was intended as a DVD, say, okay? But that this was 30 centimeters, and it contained half an hour of high quality video at the time. Remember, it was a time that we did not have any, any uh, video tapes or so, that was before that time, because uh, we started in 1769 or something on this thing. And I graduated electrical engineering in, uh, in control theory, and I was asked to uh, to uh, to work on the uh, server systems of the uh, of the uh, the remote play record. And there are three independent, more or less independent server systems tracking the uh, tracking the track of the uh, of the VOD in a similar fashion as the CD and the DVD. Well, the VOD, the, the, the video record, never became an interesting product. It was brought to market by Philips and after three years it was withdrawn to the market because there was no interest in it. But fortunately the te technology could be used later uh, by, uh, by Philips and other companies for their uh, CDs and uh, that, as we know, has become a great success. But that's what well, we will be talking about in the next uh, half an hour or so, the success for the CD. But anyway, that's how I became involved in the in the optical recording, and as I said, it was a group of physicists, okay? I was the only electronic engineer working at that group, and at a certain moment in time, we were asked to make a sound-only disc, okay? And uh, we started with uh, white band and um, later we decided to go to digital technology. And because I was the only electronic engineer in that group, they said, okay, it's your job, just to make it digital, okay? Make it this way, or make it this way. Sometimes just because there's nobody else to become the expert in it. Can I ask you a very interesting question? Do you have one Dutch gilda with you today? <laughs> Do I need one? <laughs> no, I don't. No, no, no. Maybe I'll be needed next year or so. I don't know, but uh, maybe I can show you. <laughs> anyway, it's a, it's a fascinating time with all the uh, euros and gilders, that's right. Okay, I have a different thing in mind, something you told me and then ready. <laughs> if you don't cover it with me, hold for now, I'll come back to it. Alright, okay. Okay, so okay. without well, any further ado, we'll find the start count and just talk about Beethoven. Okay, maybe, maybe, we'll 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 maybe a little bit about Shen and, and about uh, all these important people that play a role in the uh, compact disc, as you know. Shall I start? Okay, sure. Uh, let me see. Okay. I'd like to uh, thank you, uh, Stefan, for the nice introduction. This was uh, much more different than uh, the normal reading of the biography. I like that very much. Thank you. 
And of course, I'd like to uh, thank the uh, committee for asking me to be here. And I'd like to thank you for coming here so early in the morning, specifically for those people from the United States. It's been very, very early now. And um, we, talk, we will be talking uh, about the Olympic Games for sure, but also the main issue I'd like to uh, discuss is a historical thing about the reproduction of sound, about music, music as we know it been around for us everywhere. Music is for most people pure emotion, pure emotion. It's, uh, some people cry a lot, cry if they hear a piece of music. That has not been the case for so long because the reproduction of sound was started maybe in, well, started in 1870 or so by the invention of uh, Edison. But music as such has been around Maybe since the very early people walked on this earth, because I can, well, I sat in the underground and I saw all these Neanderthal people. The only music they made was probably singing, so they had called uh, a deer or another animal and they were having their first fire, they had invented fire, okay, and they probably they were just sitting around this campfire singing. Okay, maybe yippee yay, yay maybe yippee yay, yo, some uh, cowboy songs, I don't know what these the other were doing. But anyway, they were having fun. And later, they uh, came up with musical instruments, probably uh, uh, drums, are very easy to make, I think, drums, and uh, uh, string instruments, maybe. Uh, but anyway, and uh, the flute is maybe a more complicated instrument, but I don't know. I, I should have studied uh, uh, more about the history of musical instruments. But anyway, um, you, of course, in the in the Bible, the Christian Bible, you all already mentioned about symbols and uh, about the uh, horns, the horns of Jericho, the trumpet, the trumpet of Jericho. So you have instruments everywhere, and it's fascinating that it took so long, so long before the first guy actually got the idea to make a product to reproduce sound. Okay, let's first look at the, uh, this one. I like this very much because this is a painting from my uh, fellow countryman Vermeer from 1662, where you see a music instrument, on the, uh, a music instrument called the harpichord. And uh, it's fascinating, it's a complicated instrument. Uh, the, um, the first, so this is the um, more or less a historical backline of the, uh, of the of all the inventions that, that were made for reproducing sound. And as I said, I'm very surprised, and probably you were not surprised before I mentioned it, but, but it was 1877 before, well, when Edison started more or less with his very first experiment of storing sound, okay, of reproducing sound. Why was he so late? Why was mankind so late with this kind of invention? Because, well, because a real invention, because most of the inventions, like the car or the airplane, they are more or less waiting for a so-called enabling technology for an aircraft. That's easy, you need a motor low weight motor. But for the Edison machine, there was no there was no waiting for an enabling technology. Everything was there. All components were there from the early beginning of mankind. But nobody came to the idea, let's make a product for because let's be quite clear. Think wax. Wax was there for thousands of years. A horn had just mentioned the horns of Jericho. They have been there for thousands of years. And needle, well, needles were everywhere in the nature. You can easily find them, maybe not steel, but iron was there. So why took it so long before somebody like Edison came up with the idea to combine the three things, wax in a cylinder, a needle, and an iron to turn around? I don't know. Maybe you know. Maybe we can discuss that later. But anyway, it's fascinating that it took so long time. Maybe the only answer that I know is that nobody needed that invention. Maybe it's just simple like that. Nobody needed to, uh, to, uh, to reproduce sound. Anyway, the, um, 
Edison cylinder was definitely the first one, but it was not really very handy to reproduce uh, the cylinders. They were all more or less uh, unique material. So if there was a band playing and they had a hit, okay, it could not be reproduced. So if you had a hit, you had to play that music a hundred times or a thousand times, okay? Do you see you playing the Tiger Act a thousand times a day or so? But that's what they did actually in the early or the late 1900s or so. It's fascinating. Then the burning of this came and that could easily be reproduced. That took 10 years, as you can see, to do so. Then 1910, with the invention of the electron tube, we had the electronic amplification. Then five years after the uh, after the uh, war, the Second World War, we had the uh, introduction of the uh, LP. And ten years later, we had the stereo LP. And then in 1982, we had the introduction of the compact disc, which is a long series. And probably, probably, but I will end with that. We have time. This is the finish. The compact disc is the finish or the last real instrument real product that's really connected to sound, okay? In the future already now, in the future already started, sound will be everywhere, will be probably on some anonymous servers somewhere in the cloud. And uh, so there will not be just one product that... Uh, okay. This is um, just an example of um, uh, the studio of Edison in 1900 or so. You can see the horns, lots of horns, Now I'd like to uh, start with the uh, history of optical media. As, I, as we already discussed prior, uh, before we started the uh, discussion, I, um, I worked from 1970 or so on the video disc department and film research, where Mr. Pompan, whose name is mentioned as one of the uh, great inventions of the uh, video disc, started by, uh, by using uh, a laser for reading uh, small features on, uh, on plastic disc. The laser at the time, so it was the, uh, well, was the required enabling technology, because at the time the lasers, the helium neon lasers, costed at least uh, 100,000 euro per piece. So the thing that you can do that thing into uh, consumer phones problems was really uh, fascinating. But anyway, <coughs> he succeeded. At some time, we were working on the video disc, there was a question from the audio department, Philips, if we could make an sound only disc. The director of my Philips research said, of course we can, because, well, the video disc contains video and sound. So, to make a sound only disc is, well, it's trivial, he said, to his. So. And my engineers are not doing trivial things. So he just sent this guy, this big guy, this big director from audio. He sent him away. We are not doing that. This was the old days when Philips, the well research department, were really independent of. Uh, and um, okay, the only thing that happened actually is that two engineers from the audio department came to Philips Research and they started doing work on a sound audio disc. They started with high band. Um, FM, frequency modulation, and later we, uh, we did some work on uh, digital um, sound because the, uh, well, because the high, well, because the FM modulation really don't work. You still have these clicks, the same effect that you have in the old telephone, you would tick, tick, tick every time. And you could not, well, with a regular analog system, you cannot get rid of that. Only with digital system, you can actually correct all the errors that you that you have during uh, the dropouts and so on. In uh, 79, for a year or so, we had a cooperation by Philips and Sony. In 79, both companies introduced their uh, prototypes, and uh, they were completely different prototypes, actually. And uh, at some moment in time, the, uh, the, the directors of Philips, decided to, uh, of Philips and Sony decided to, uh, to join the operation, to have a joint operation kind of standard, kind of the best between the two worlds and so on. And a few of the, a few of a few engineers of Philips and Sony had a task force, and was one of those engineers in the task force who uh, 
who made the CD, he made a stand at home. Yeah. Made the choices, made the experiments in, in Eindhoven and in Tokyo, and he came out with the, the, uh, the Compact Disc in 1982. The first introduction was in Japan, and half a day later was uh, introduced into the rest of the world. This is the Compact Disc, okay? It's, um, it's a small, a small disc of 120 millimeters, and the real invention is actually that we have that the that the that the bits and the pictures are on the upper side, and that you read it through uh, through a protective layer of approximately 1.2 millimeters, and the, all the uh, fingerprints and dirt, etc., are far out of focus, and uh, that of course helps you to uh, have a better signal. So here you can see again how the uh, optical readout is done. So you need a laser at the right, and, uh, and you have some mirrors, and uh, the, actually the light is reflecting from the, uh, from the optical disc to the, uh, to the, to the photodiode. And uh, the photodiode actually uh, is uh, detecting all the bits, the ones and the zeros. And you have servo system for actually uh, uh, tracking the track and being in focus. And we, uh, <coughs> that's a great job actually because the accuracy as you talk about is, uh, is a tens of a micron or so, both in focus and in the reading of the so, uh, so, what was the, uh, at that time in 1979, we're now discussing uh, the uh, strategic alliance. Philips was good, they had some uh, shoe boxes full of IP in, uh, in actual property. Uh, on the video long play record, they have all the basic inventions like I just showed with the, uh, with the uh, protective layer, reading through, through a protective layer using a focus beam. That's the greatest invention. Well, that's the invention by the uh, And there, are, there were probably a thousand more patterns because well, it had been working for 10 years. Ago. And Sony had a great, um, great effort in digital audio systems. Because they started already in digital sound maybe five years earlier than, uh, than Philips or many other companies. And they had great um, knowledge about coding technology, air correction, and uh, everything. This is what we uh, started in uh, 1979. So you can see that Philips really didn't matter about the uh, sampling rate of the. Uh, of the um, of the sound, and uh, here actually, now the first part, well, here actually the, well, the, all we know is that it should be a factor of two more than the highest frequency, because that was sharing actually the theory that stated that if you, if you sample twice as fast as the bandwidth of the signal, then you can reconstruct that signal without any loss, okay, that's basic Shannon's theory, um, sampling theory. Sony was more practical and they had only two choices, 44.1 and 44.068. And it had to do more or less with the fact that at that time there were no, no magnetic recording systems and they were all based on video systems at the time. And, uh, and there were discrete number of lines and video computation and you end up with 44.1 for the PAL for the European system and 44.068 for the NTC American system. Philips had a 14 proposed a 14-bit system, so in 16, as you can see, playing time around an hour. The flip disk was 11 and a half centimeters. Um, Sony proposed a 10 centimeter disk and the error correction code to be determined. Channel code, some, okay, some M3, forget it. And uh, Sony had no proposal at that time. Okay. So uh, this is how we started in 1979. They all had prototypes, so uh, that's it. That's how actually we started the 11 and a half centimeters because the director of audio that I just mentioned, he, he became big because he started with the compact cassette. Probably you are old enough to know the compact cassette, which is an audio tape system, and it had a diameter across the diameter of 11 and a half centimeters. And this director said, Nobody ever complained about the size of my compact cassette, so the CD should have the same size. I like that. Items, okay? They are simple, straightforward, and you may expect that from a director of films, okay? Like that. And I don't know how to send it to be. Nice, okay. 
but it will change. Sure, it will change. You will see that in the next slide, probably. So he proposed and said, oh, well, showed 150, 150 minute minutes of playing time on 30 centimeter disc and dips an hour on an 11 half centimeter disc. 79, everything changed. Everything changed. We were a few engineers, we were in Tokyo and we were discussing all kinds of coding technologies and then we received a phone call and uh, the playing time should be 74 minutes. Before that we were just discussing the playing time of an hour and all the parameters and all the choices were made for that. Why 74 minutes? It had to accommodate, as you can read, Ford Wengler's Beethoven's Ninth Symphony which is the slowest ninth of Beethoven that ever was played in 1956. It's mono. It's an awful quality. You can't even listen to it. And, uh, but anyway, why was it? Well, this, I really don't know. But I can only guess. It's, it's an educated guess why this was changed into 74 minutes. It was postulated, if you read the, uh, the, 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 uh, the literature in, the, in, in this thing, you can see that Mr. Oga, Dr. Oga, who was a, was a musician, and he was also the president of, uh, of Sony at the time. And he said, I love Beethoven's night so much, and also my wife likes it so much. It must be one disc, not only two. We don't like that. We need 74 minutes for that. Because they did some research, and the slowest one was 74 minutes. Of course, you cannot read a gentleman's mind, but I think. And he knew that Philips was producing CD discs in the Hanover facility here in Germany with a diameter of 11 and a half centimeters. And of course, they, uh, if Sony would have allowed 11 and a half centimeters, then Philips would have had an advantage over Sony. Okay, so. By changing the playing time into 74 minutes, it could only be accommodated in a 12 centimeter disc. So Philips in Hanover had to change all the equipment because of his so called love for Beethoven's Night. So I am a civic engineer, so I believe my story more than his emotional story about Beethoven. So that's why now Beethoven came into the story, okay? So that's but again, it's my speculation. I, I do not understand. I was one of the engineers in the back door, in the back room, uh, where the phone rang. They said, it must be 74 minutes. Okay, that's how it happened. These are the technical uh, decisions that we, uh, that we made. We made the, uh, as you can see, it's more or less become a Sony disc because the choice was made for the 44.1 kilohertz because we had to accommodate the, uh, the storage of sound uh, using. Uh, the tapes, and that can only be done by a video recorder. The resolution was 16 bits. The uh, error correction was a cross into the read sonar code. I'm not discussing the read sonar code. The diameter is 12 centimeters to accommodate the playing time of 74 minutes and 33 seconds. And uh, the channel code was the event. Just an anecdote about the playing time. We used a equipment, well, video equipment for as an intermediate between the studios and the facility houses that made ma the, the, the mastering for the CDs. And they used the uh, Beta Max machines or something, or uh, professional Beta Max. And these machines would only accommodate 69 minutes of music. So it took at least six or seven years before the first CD could be produced that could actually do the 74 minutes. But anyway, that's a long story. But that's enough. The uh, third code using two short read sonar codes and uh, the rate is 3 over 4, which means that uh, 1 in 4 bytes is used for error correction. The interleaving memory is 16 kilobits, so it's 2 kilobytes. At that time, we were discussing this with Sony, and this was a proposal made by Sony in 1979. And my, my boss said, Are oh, these Sony guys really mad? 16 kilobytes. Do you know how much that cost? I didn't know that. But he knew that it costed at that time $200. I said, we want to sell our product for $200. And only this device, this memory, cost $200. Now it's absolutely impossible to buy a separate memory of 16, of 2 kilobytes or so. so 
you can see how quick and how fast the uh, things are changing. These are the uh, characteristics of the crust into the bridge from the coast. And you can uh, correct random errors and you can get correct bursts of errors that develop that can you can actually interpolate error bursts because we are uh, talking about sound and you have a simple decoder strategy that is of course important at that time for the AT14 modulation is a, is a coding technology that is so-called DC free. So there are no components or in the spectrum that are very near DC, which helps very much the, uh, the server systems and that is a minimum and a maximum run length of three and a half and a run length is defined as the uh, minimum number of consecutive zeros or ones. And uh, if you have uh, a long minimum run length that helps uh, with the uh, detection quality and you need a maximum of run length because otherwise you lose clocking and you lose all of that important things. This was the first, first encoding uh, circuitry. It was probably, as you can see, the whole player consisted of, of four or five chips. Of course, the, the most important one was the, uh, the DA converter. Uh, yes, the DA converter using uh, Upsampling by a factor of four, because well, the uh, Phillips engineering is concentrated on 14 bits instead of 16 bits, and, and, and well, everything was changed into 16 bits, so they had to come up with an invention, and they said, okay, well, we can use a 14 bit DAC if we oversample by a factor of four, then you get 14 or 16 bits. Then. Actually, that's what they did, and you see all the oversampling and all the things here in this electronics. At that time, one of the most complicated electronic components made from consumer electronics product in 1982. So 45 square millimeters contains about 12,000 bits. Probably now we can find and build more components on, uh, on, on current hardware. Well, what was the impact of the uh, CD of the compact disc? I think, uh, at that time, the, uh, the, the music industry may be uh, the situation now the same, but anyway, the music industry was dying because, well, people made copies on the, uh, on the compact assets. And, well, and the compact uh, disc broke life because, well, after some time, I must say, because the, uh, also the CD had a difficult time. It took at least four or five years because it was really uh, accepted by the larger public. It was the, um, the absolute big bang of the digital audio and video revolution. Only uh, five or ten years later, we saw the uh, digital revolution, we saw compressed sound like the MP3, and uh, we saw much more. It all started in 1982 with the uh, Aeropraction codes, that was the domain of mathematicians, and uh, who went on and were introduced into the consumer electronics. Uh, Field. It was a big step at the time, and uh, it also, the compact disc also made possible the introduction of new optical media like the DVD, which has a factor of 10 more storage capacity, and the Blu ray, which has a factor of 15 more, yes, 15 more than the uh, compact that was introduced in, uh, five years ago or six years ago. So it had an enormous impact, but it also had an enormous impact on uh, this is the positive side. But I didn't uh, write about the negative side. It also had a negative impact on lots of mechanical engineers. Because there were so many companies that had, that had electronic companies here in Germany or in the United States that, 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 were, that made gramophones. And uh, they had uh, needles, they had special needles, they had special arms, they had high five, well, you know how these things work. And all these mechanical engineers were 10 years were out of jobs because, well, the CD cost maybe $10 and they played much better than the $10,000 uh, gramophone. But anyway, that's a long discussion. Maybe there are questions about it, but anyway, it's. Uh, and that is the negative side of it. So, I. And you see even more, but anyway, this is from CD to DVD to Blu ray. In the left side, you can see uh, that the laser light is uh, infrared 
and that the uh, opening of the lens, the distribution for the numerical aperture is 0.45. The DVD we go to, uh, to red laser, and the numerical aperture goes up. The larger that NA, the smaller the spot size, and the more you can store on the, uh, the disc. The DVR, the Blu-ray, has um, it's a Blu-ray, it has blue light, and uh, as an NA.85. Here you also need it very much an enabling technology because the blue, the blue lasers, when we, when Philips and Sony started their work in 1969, 19, sorry, 1996, 1997, I also worked on that. Actually, I worked on all these products, and uh, we were very dissatisfied. Uh, Sony and Philips were very dissatisfied with the outcome of the DVD, which is essentially a Toshiba, a Toshiba disc. And uh, they started almost immediately, immediately after the introduction of the DVD in the blue laser uh, disc. But there were no blue lasers available, and it took almost 10 years before the format that we had, uh, had written uh, could actually go to my market. There were no blue lasers, but that we are well enough and with sufficient lifetime. So here uh, we have the success, success story of the CD of opt optical recording and numbers. So we had the introduction in 1982, 1985 we had the CD-ROM where you can store, instead of sound, you can store data, digital data, lots of digital data. At that time, a half gigabyte was an enormous number because the Apple computers at that time, the Apple II computers, well, they had storage capacity of 16 kilobits or so, we are actually measuring in kilos instead of giga. The CD Recorder was introduced in 1992, which was uh, quite an invention to come up with the right material for recording. The video CD, then in 1995, as said, uh, was a product by Toshiba because, well, let's be very honest, all the royalty and you know, all the income of the uh, optical recording went to only two companies, that was Philips and Sony, and all the rest of the companies, like Panasonic. Uh, Toshiba, Pioneer, uh, they didn't make any money on that. And, uh, of course, Philips and Sony didn't want to change that, uh, but the other companies, of course, they liked to shake that tree and they wanted to start to introduce some uh, other product. And that's what Toshiba did, and they started with the DVD. 2006, they had the introduction of the Blu ray disc with a capacity of 25 gigabyte. And uh, my last number, because that was the uh, I mean, 25 years after the introduction of the CD, Philips and Sony came up with the number of 200 billion discs were sold since the introduction of the, uh, of the, uh, of the CD. Now, I have still five minutes or so to, uh, to use my glass ball and see what's in the future of digital audio and video. Well, I think that uh, with Blu-ray disc, I think the uh, the optical products has come to an end. I, there is no research or development in uh, new products within Philips, definitely not, definitely not in Philips. They, uh, they concluded their work on optical recording maybe uh, six years ago. Nobody worked on that. Sony is doing with maybe 10 people is doing some work and uh, Itachi, I believe. And then I think we have all the companies that are really working hard. So there's no money. And also, if you, if you like we had a very nice introduction at the Las Vegas ICC where somebody from the optical recording field showed how complicated it is to go to much higher capacities, much higher playing times because you're really running into uh, mechanical problems of the accuracies that you need. And, uh, so the conclusion is we do not have, we do not expect any, any products on optical recording. What is the um, that, and if you look at what's happening now in the, uh, in the world of sound and video recording, then you see that, that most people have no real product anymore. Up till now, we had a very simple sales product. There was a publisher uh, who asked a musician to make music, and they sold the discs from, well, actually it started in 1880, okay? So more than 100 years, we were having the same sales model, but now, the sales model has completely changed because uh, most of the sound is now in the cloud, as we say, it's, it's, it's somewhere in the server. We can actually
connect to that server using our smartphones, using our tablets, using our computers, using our radios, and there are no real products anymore. The only disadvantage I see is that, well, is that in the old days you could buy a nice CD or a nice product in a jewel case and you could give that to your mother so that you could play Beethoven or something like that. But now you have to give her a voucher so that she can download, she doesn't know how to do it, but she can download the Beethoven from an anonymous server. Anyway, that's how it is and I cannot change that. Anyway, that's my, uh, my uh, look at the history and uh, it's a very short look at the, uh, at the future of the sound world. Is I hope ample time to have some questions. Is that so? Okay. Thank you. Before we questions, I'd like to ask Keith uh, one question. Remember, we talked about the Dutch Gilda? Yeah. If you put all the specs, you put all the Sony specs down, only one Philips spec, you've got the most important, the Dutch Gilda. <laughs> no, actually, actually, it must be not a Gilda. Now I. Uh, it's the, um, it's the inner diameter of the uh, CD was also uh, stabilized by, by a boss of mine, and it was the Dutch uh, 10 cents actually that has a diameter. That's okay. That's the uh, the 10 cents of the Dutch builder um, has a diameter of 50 millimeters, and it was exactly the size of the inner hole of the uh, CD. Because well, my boss said, well, we can discuss it for a long time. He put this coin on the table and he said, why, what's wrong with this side? I said, okay, it's fine. Next, next place. So, sometimes you can do things very easily and very, uh, very briefly. Yes, why should we have a discussion of 4.5 millimeters or thermal inches or whatever, I don't know. But it was, try it. If you can find this, uh, that's 10 cents, then you can see that's exactly the same. Okay, questions. You have another one. Any questions? Otherwise, I will be here later and uh, we can discuss the 10 cents or the 10 millions or whatever. But anyway, would you have any questions? No? Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Keith, for your very technical uh, presentation. Uh, also, as a part of being a technical presentation, also about engineering management and decision making. <laughs> 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 yeah, sometimes a decision has to be made. Yes, that's right. Okay. Thank uh, you. Thank you.